I'm Jim Brown, your Bible teacher here at Grace and Truth Ministries. I always read to you some of our emails that we get from around the world, from France and Australia and, and uh, Germany, and we are on in Holland, and, and uh, people see us from everywhere. The reason they write to me is... <coughs> I teach a lot of, I teach more information than any preacher that I know of in America. And I don't mean that in a boast. It's dis distressing to me to know that preachers don't tell hardly any truth. And uh, when you give, when I pay, put 50 Greek words on the board in one lesson, tell you what they mean. They don't mean what the preachers say. <laughs> when you preach predestination, most of the world hates that. Even though it's true, uh, the world doesn't like the truth. And so a lot of people writing and asking how they answer people, and some people are writing insulting me, saying, you're an evil man, and you don't have any... Most people who write like that, one guy's been writing to me and telling me I was evil and I was going to go to hell one day. No, I think you're going to hell, mister. And I, we were on the, t the internet all over the world. We're on TV in about 275 towns and cities. And these people write to us from everywhere. Dylan Schuweiler in Texas writes to us. He's been writing to us a long time. Dear Brother Jim, I've been reading and studying, stumbling across the theory of evolution yet again. Well, I don't believe in evolution like the scientists believe in it. Do you have any thoughts on the matter? Haven't you heard me teach on Genesis, the first chapter? I don't know how God made Adam alive, but I know he formed his body from the dust to the ground. Then he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. How he did that, we can't think of that in human uh vernacular in, in our human speech in the 21st century. We don't know that. I tend to be very picky question when it comes to learning. I am very solemn. I, I don't believe what the Baptist preachers, my father and Jerry Falwell and those independent Baptists believe and the Southern Baptists. I don't believe the earth is 6,000 years old. That's idiocy. It's stupid to say that. The Bible teaches that in the beginning God created. Create is the word bara. Well, there, don't write. All right. Create is the word bara. And that's a righteous word. It means to cut and make fat. Cut and make fat. It doesn't mean our word fat. The fat of the land was the richest of the crops, the richest of the grain, the richest of the wheat. The fat of the cattle was the richest cattle. Remember when Pharaoh had his dream and he saw these fat, rich cattle going down and came up as lean cattle? That meant they were real healthy. And that was the beginning of seven years of Plenty and then seven years of tribulation. That's what the word fat meant. Cut and make the best. And then the earth became without form, without form. That is everything that's complete opposite to, to create. Without form is the very nature of Satan. And if you look in Re Revelation, the 12th chapter, Michael the archangel cast out one third of the angels out of heaven that rebelled with Satan. Well, in order to find out when this happened, when Satan was cast into the earth, you've got to find the first nature of Satan in the earth. You've got to find that in Genesis 1-2. 1, 2. So everything was righteous in the first verse. And then you've got to realize what the Bible says in, Re in Isaiah 45, 18. 45, 18. God says, what I created, I created nothing in vain. In vain is the word tohu, T-O-H-U-W. 
And the word without form is T-O-H-U-W. God says in Isaiah 45, 18, I did not create in the beginning what's going on in verse 2. I didn't do that. So you got to presume, and by the process of elimination, when Satan was cast out, he was cast out somewhere between verse 1 and verse 2. Now, as far as what was going on in the original creation, I don't know, you don't know, and scientists don't know. Everything is a theory. We know that God picked up Adam, made him out of that corrupt dust that Satan had corrupted and then told him, Thou shalt not, and the day you do, you'll die. He didn't say, If you eat, he said, You will eat and then die. Because you're made of corruption. That's why we sin. We're made of the same corruption as Adam. It's called flesh. I'm going to talk about that some some tonight. So, Dylan, I don't know why you haven't paid any attention to this. But you cannot come up and say evolution is true, that man was a puddle of muck in some sea and he crawled out and developed hands and developed a tail and became a monkey and climbed a tree. Uh, that's not going to get it. You can't get that out of the Bible. But you can say there's some things happened between verse 1 and 2. And there was an original creation that was made to be inhabited that was corrupted by Satan. There were six days. Not of creation. The Bible does not teach that. You're not even to the third verse yet when the earth is without form and void and darkness. You're not, even to, you're not even to the third verse that the Bible says, let there be light. Let be light. Well, in the first verse, that's where he created the heavens or the light. What does he mean here? He means here, let there be light. It means that there was an earth and there was some kind of cloud around it and the and the stars out here that were shining, it takes, let me say it again, it takes four and a half years traveling at the speed of light, which is 186,000 miles every second. That's how fast light travels. And it takes four and a half years just for light to get here from Alpha Centaurus, which is the nearest star. I don't know what happened here. No scientist knows either, but you can take the Bible and show the earth is a... The fact that light was coming, the only reason the Bible says darkness was on from the surface, it says face is the word P-A-N-I-Y-M, and it means surface. It was upon the surface of the deep. Why is it there light coming in? Because something's blocking the light from coming in. Even the best scientists, they believe there was a cloud around the earth at one time. So, if light travels that fast and all these stars up here in the sky and the light is bouncing off, then there has to be some kind of cloud around the earth. When he said, let there be light, he was saying, circumcise the earth and let the light in. That's a picture of you and I. We're created, then sin comes in our life, and those of us who God's elect, he says, let the light in. The first chapter of Genesis is a picture of God's elect family. Six is the number of man's work days. In six days, God, he didn't create in the six days. He would do the works of a potter, Yatsar, Yatsar, a potter. And he would separate the heavens, the waters from under the heavens, from the waters below the heavens. He would form things. Form is the word Yatsar. It's the word of a potter. It's a potter's term. There were six days of making and forming, but not six days of creation. I deny that. My father and all of his Baptist preacher friends would say, this earth is 6,000 years old. I heard that idiot. And people say, you shouldn't call somebody idiot. Why not? 
Jerry Falwell was idios. Idios is a Greek word. It means private or of his own. It was his own interpretation when he said, we as independent Baptists believe the earth is 6,000 years old. You're the, you were dumb, Jerry. He's dead now. Don't do any good to say it to him. He's ignorant. He hated predestination with a passion. I've heard him say that. I didn't like the man. I even worked with him one time. He didn't like it. I was a young gospel singer about 1966, and I had my own group, and we were booked into some place with him in some moose lodge. This is when he was a small preacher, and somewhere in Virginia, I can't remember where. He didn't like it because that young preacher, which was me, was up there quoting all those Bible verses. He told the promoter that. I hadn't liked him since then. He didn't like nobody's competition with him. Anyway, so much for Jerry Fallup. Falwell, excuse me. <laughs> However, I'm very confused and I'm tired of having debates. Quit debating people. They don't know nothing. If you'll notice, evolution is a theory. It's not fact, it's theory. Theory is something that people guess at with certain facts. But it's not factual. Quit arguing with that. I keep telling you, Dylan, you don't argue with anybody. Tell them the truth, they either like it or they don't. You're talking to either vessels of wrath or vessels of mercy. Vessels of mercy will listen to some degree, at least when you start talking. I certainly believe in adaptation because animals that aren't worthy enough to survive in their environment will ultimately die. That's true. Leading to changes in their species and kind. I would really appreciate any input you may have on this subject. I hope that will help you some. I by no means wish to gloat in intellect. Well, nobody can gloat in anything. If you have any understanding as a preacher... God gave it to you. What dost thou have that thou didst not receive? And why dost thou glory as though thou had not received it from God? And who makes you to differ from another? God. Nobody can gloat. That's called glorying in the scripture. I just hope to immerse myself with as much of God's truth as possible. Watch the DVDs. Listen, 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 listen. I've spent 67 years studying Bible. No small amount of time. I don't study for 20 minutes before I come to do a message. I study all the time, every day, constantly. If I'm around a book, I pull it down and look at it while uh, a ball game's going on. I look up words constantly. I question literally everything in my life. Well, good for you. That is something that the Lord has given me, and I believe it will never leave. I thank him for that. Thank you for always reading, being patient, kind, and sincere with me over these years. Hope to keep growing in my understanding of God's word and his commands of me. I love you and everyone there. Agape Dylan Schuwaller in Texas. Dylan, nobody taught me this. I learned the speed of light in physics in high school. I learned that in about 1954. I learned that how light, fast, light, fast light travels from that. I learned bara to cut and make fat from my Strong's Exhaustive Concordance and from some other dictionaries that I have. I've got over 2,000 books in my library, and I'm constantly studying. I learned without form from a Strong's Impulsive Concordance. And I've also got a book called Adele and Scott English, and they got about 45,000 Greek words in that. A lot of times if I wrestle with something, I go to that. Or I go to uh, Mr. Kittle's New Testament of Greek words and it's 10 volumes it's got 34 pages just on agape now that's the truth I hope that'll help you Dylan don't argue with people about anything don't you're told not to debate anything 
Read the Word of God. Give the definition. And you'll never get all the answers. Nobody has ever done that. I'm old. I'm 83. I've never met a preacher or a doctor of theology that had all the answers. I've read a whole bunch of them. i got a bunch of them in my library. I'll be reading one guy and say, this is not true. Where'd you come up that Dr. So-and-so, LLD, DD, dead dog? I mean, that's what I want to call them. You won't find any Baptist preachers preaching that. You're not going to find it. Now, Dylan, we love you. Robin and Whale in Amarillo, Texas, mother and son. Hello, Pastor Jim and Mary and staff. Much agape to all of you. I wanted to send you an update in regards to my health. She's got leukemia. She keeps going in and out of remission. I got the results back in regards to my leukemia. They have increased from the last test. I will see my oncologist. That's a blood doctor. I had to go to that when I had those those blood clots in my lung. I had that oncologist I went to. I sat there and talked to him for about 30 minutes about Greek words in the Bible. He said, you're a very interesting man. Now, an oncologist is an advanced blood doctor. He's a guy that's brilliant. They're not just the average MD. He said, I will see my oncologist on the 29th of June. Lord willing, dealing with my fibromyalgia, I have my good days and some okay days, but then those really tough days. I know it's the Lord's will upon my life. He is taking care of me and us all. The medication somewhat helps, but what I have noticed, what helps the most is staying mobile, doing my stretching and walking. For that, I am thankful that I am able to do that. I do hope that yourself and Mary are doing well and staying safe. I'm sure you are. Your teachings have been extraordinary and very thought-provoking. I've never sat under any Bible teacher, never. I heard Dr. Roy Kemp preach about two messages, and he challenged me to start studying for myself. I've heard a free, a few doctors of the, theology, and I've never been impressed with any of them except Dr. Kemp. None of them. I am grateful that you are my pastor and my teacher. Love you very much more than words that I can say. I will keep you posted and updated on what my oncologist says that we must do. The Lord is in charge of everything. Thank you. That's true. Also, I want to say thank you so much for the update in regards to Danielle. She's been in touch with Danielle, the lady that is... Uh, a paraplegic. I have been trying to reach her, but have got, have not gotten a response. I try to call her sometimes, and she's hard to reach. But she is crippled, and she can't always reach her phone. I'm sure she's dealing with a lot. She is. So I will wait until she is ready to reach out. Thank you again. Again, I pray you both please take care and continue to stay safe. Much agape and flail. Robin and Will in Amarillo, Texas. We love you guys. And then I got some YouTube comments. These are people that mostly don't like me. They give me a hard time. Uh, Nathan Lidget, L-I-D-G-E-T-T, commented on Revelation, Babylon is God's razor strap. The ten horns destroy Babylon. I'm sorry, but the seven heads and the ten horns are the seven high holy hills. <laughs> a head was a capital city of an empire. One of the heads was wounded to death. That was Rome when the Roman Empire who worshipped, had the fire worship, the two of the, two of the Caesars said, we will not wear the priest of this Pontifex Maximus, high priest of Rome. And they took that and put it right into the Roman Catholic Church. That was the deadly wound of the head that was healed. And the Ten Commandments, and the lion is the, is it, what? And the lion is Adam the bear. 
is Noah the lion, is Moses the four heads, <laughs> in Numbers 1 and 2. Judah, Reuben, Ephraim, and Dan, the fourth beast is the Levites. I, I can't even, I don't even know what you're talking about. Priesthood, you know Greek, but this is Hebrew. Know your feast day of Revelation 13 is the metaphor of D D D Daniel 7 and 2 Chronicles 9. All. Did anybody understand that? I didn't. I know what he's talking about, and I'm not going to go into those chapters. And he's ignorant. You sound like you're about 17 years old, Nathan, or maybe 15. And you heard somebody preach on this, and you got an opinion. Anyway, four children's rights. She's been writing this a long time. As many as walk according to the rule of the new creation is God's Israel. That's right. Was Abiathar Bathsheba's grandpa? No. Ahithophel was Bathsheba's grandpa. I'm not going to go into that again. Ahithophel, David's chief counselor. That's why David must have known who she was when she walked in the palace when he saw her naked on the housetop and he said, I want her and somebody brought her over. She had to come in and saying, where's my grandpa Ahithophel? He had to know who she was. Ernesto, Ernest Sereno commented on 4168, spiritual Israel is the Gentile church. Spiritual circumcision is blood baptism or cutting off the outer man. Gentiles were grafted into the olive tree by faith. The church is made up of Jews and Gentiles. Gentiles are spiritual Jews. A Jew is not outwardly above the heart that believe in Jesus. There really is no Gentile church because of the beginning the church was founded by Jewish believers. Although later on became Gentiles. I don't know how later on they became Gentiles. I preached on that great degree, Ernest. You need to watch a bunch of my DVDs. Bardo Wasselius commented on signs of the times. Um, and he says, in Mark, May 14, 1948, event was a physical regathering of an apostate remnant. I agree with that. Led by Babylonian rabbis. I'll agree with that. Descending from the Pharisees, that's right, in a physical piece of the land, that's right, too. The big question is, if this really is the fulfillment of the regathering of Israel, I haven't said that it was. I said that's where man declared them a nation for the first time in 2,600 years. But I do believe, according to the four wars, that they were overwhelming victorious. There had to be God involved in it. They were overwhelmingly victorious in the War of Independence. May, May 15th, it began, 1948, when they declared themselves in nations, May 14th. And then they had the War of 67, the Sinai War. They had the, the Six-Day War of, of 1967, May 5th through May 10th. Then they had the, the Yom Kippur War, the, the Day of Atonement War, in 73. It may very well be a sign, and God allows it for a reason. I believe there's possibly, nobody knows the end. I believe there's possibly going to be some of the Jews in literal Israel that's going to believe, but they're going to have to come through Jesus Christ. No man comes to the Father, but by me, Jesus said. It looks more like a great deception to blind the eyes of both unbelieving Jews and carnal Christians. Carnal Christians are not going to be permanently blinded. It's possible for Christians to be carnal, just like uh, 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, the Corinthians were carnal. That exalt an unbelieving nation. I don't exalt a nation. I exalt the work of God that he's done with them. As the people of God. Well, I'm not saying they're the people of God. God's people are circumcised of the heart. A Jew is not out with him, but of the heart. The true regathering is spiritual. I agree with that. And is in Christ only. I agree with that. 
We don't know that some of those Jews are not apart due to all those miraculous wars that God caused them to win. The day after they became a nation, 45 million Jews declared war with about 250,000 Israelis, and the Israelis were just tremendously outnumbered and were outgunned. They had 10,000 rifles and 10,000 rounds of ammunition and a few old World War II relic cannons, just old war out cannons, and they shouldn't have won, but they did. God had to intervene. God will save a remnant from the Jews, though I believe that. Everything will change when the sons of God will be revealed. Sons of God is a name for believers. Many of the Abrahamic religions will realize they have been deceived and leave Babylon as it collapses. Babylon is an international worldwide system founded on self. Let us make us a name. Right again, you sound like you're on some good trails, Bardo. Or you can watch some of my messages on that. I've done probably 200 just on the end of time. And then RVS77 commented on Revelation, New Heavens, the ruling class, the church. What do you mean that demons do not exist? You want me to sit here and talk for two hours and I'll just get started? Demon is the word demonion. And it means to distribute fortunes. And they called all of their gods of the ancient world demons. And Paul said, you offer sacrifices to demons. It says gods in the 10th chapter of, of 1 Corinthians. But the word is demonion. Jesus, I'm not going to go into this. Watch my DVDs. I've got dozens and dozens of them on the Internet. If you really are interested, I'm not going to sit here and go through all this with you. Jesus said demons were self. That's what he said. That Jesus never mentioned demons. He didn't say a man had demons. They said, they walked up to Jesus like Mark, Matthew, the 17th chapter. My son is lunatic. Lunatic comes from lunar, which is the word moon. And it means moonstruck. That meant he was either a vampire or he was a werewolf. You think Jesus believed that man? No. When the man said, I've got a legion in me. Legion was at least 3,000 to 6,000 Roman soldiers. Jesus didn't say he had legion. He said he had legion because their whole society said that. Matthew 12, 45. Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself. An unclean spirit is the word. That's what Jesus rebuked the man who had the unclean spirit. But it, Jesus called it him. He rebuked him in Mark, the first chapter. It was the man's wickedness in his heart. And they enter in and dwell there in the last state of the man is worse than the first. Jesus never said the man had demons. You look up in McClinic and Strong. If you've got a computer, you can get McClinic and Strong on your computer. Get the P volume. Look up Possessed with Devils, and it'll tell you it means to be insane. And when the man came to his right mind, he was sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, so for nail, his sane mind. He was insane before, and now he's sane. I'm not going to spend two hours teaching you about demons. You want to know about demons? I've got probably at least 150 messages on that on the Internet. Look it up, unless you're too lazy to. Personal UJ commented on Babylon is God's razor strap, the ten horns, destroy Babylon. When Jesus said before Abraham was, I am, means he was in heaven. no. It meant he was the I am God of the Old Testament. When Moses said, when I go tell the people that you're going to follow me into the wilderness and I'm going to let them go, what if they say, who is, what is his name? He said, you tell them, I am hath sent me. 
nothing remotely implying he is God. Certainly it is. Am is a form of the verb to be or to exist. That's what am means, I exist. Jehovah means self-existent. You don't listen to anything that I'm teaching, do you? Personal UJ. Stop confusing the world with your other gods. You're an ignoramus. That means someone who's completely unlearned. There's only one God, the Father, and next to him there's no other. So you don't believe that Jesus is God or that the Holy Spirit was God. Jesus said before Abraham was, I am. And the Jews took up stones to stone him because he made himself equal with the Father. You hadn't read all of that, have you? Personal UJ, you're very ignorant. Jim Smith writes and comments on if we are not spiritual Israel. Why did God use spiritual Passover, Pentecost, and the day of atonement to birth the Gentile church? The Gentile was not birthed on the day of Pentecost. You sure are ignorant, aren't you? Pentecost was in Acts 2. That was the birth of the church. There was a rushing mighty wind. Rushing mighty wind, according to Hastings Encyclopedia of Religion, it means it means breath. That's where the church was birthed at Pentecost. They were all Jews until Paul was sent to the Gentiles <laughs> in Acts 9. No, I'm sorry. Peter's the first one to preach to the Gentiles in Acts 10. You really don't know the Bible, do you? Acts 10, it took a miracle for Peter to go to the first Gentile to be ministered to. Jesus told the Gentiles, told the disciples not to go to the Gentiles. He did not tell them that. You really don't know much about the Bible. Go only to the lost sheep of the hours of Israel, to the house of Israel. The lost sheep was the ten northern tribes. That was the Jews. On the day of Pentecost, 3,000 Jews were added to the believers who followed Jesus before the cross. Before the cross. And Jim, you need to get together with that personal UJ and y'all become your own Bible teachers because both of you don't know nothing. Automatic commented on spiritual biology, white blood cells from red bone marrow, spiritual DNA, and hemoglobin. Scorpions also glow in the dark. We well, have yeah, priests on scorpions. Scorpions are false teachers. Many scientists don't know why they glow in the dark, but since you broke it down nicely, scorpions glow in the dark because they try to imitate the light or Jesus. They are counterfeit source of light. You're exactly right on that. Thank you for that. That'll be enough reading. Enough reading. And you guys... Asking dumb questions. Ask a question that's biblical. You you surmising things yourself that's exactly opposite to the Bible. You really are wasting my time. I don't mind answering questions that are legitimate. But you want to write me and fight me? And I've spent 66, 67 years studying Bible and you've studied six weeks. Or let's just say six years, which is not even... And you haven't studied Greek and Hebrew and history, culture, customs, idioms, metaphors. I'm amazed at how ignorant the world is. We are on TV all over America. We're on about 275 towns and cities. One guy says he's going to have me kicked off of TV. Okay, good luck. <laughs> We're paying for the time. He says, I'm going to call the station. Have you kicked off with all your lies about predestination? His name is J.P. Phipps. He said, he is dumb. He just really is dumb. Because I believe he's, a, I believe he's an apostolic because he talks about one God. No, not three persons in it. And that's, of course, they believe you have to be dipped in water in the name of Jesus only. Otherwise, you're going to hell. And T.D. Jakes was a United Pentecostal. He was a oneness preacher. And by his doctrine, he don't believe Kenneth Copeland or Fred Price or uh, T.D. Jakes or don't believe that uh, Jesse Duplantis or any of the rest of those preachers are going to heaven. And he goes on and preaches in their churches and on their 
TV, but he don't believe anybody's going to heaven if you're not dipped in the name of, dipped in water in the name of Jesus only. That's the Jesus only people, and T.D. Jakes is one of them. Just ignorant. We are on TV all over the country. We're on TV in Nashville Monday, Wednesday, and Friday night at eight thirty. Be on tonight at eight thirty, and we're on. Uh, uh, on Channel 49, Comcast TV, Nashville, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday night, 8.30. Sunday morning at 9 o'clock, we're on Radio in Nashville. We're on WNQM every Saturday morning, every Saturday morning at uh, 9 o'clock. And we're on, we're on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday night on WN, uh, on uh, Com, on com, on Comcast TV, and uh, if you want a free DVD, we give them away free of charge, and we never solicit you after you want DVDs. I don't have time to get on the phone calling everybody that calls us from all over the country. I don't have time to get on the phone and talk to everybody and ask them for money. I never ask anybody for money. It takes about $45,000 a month to make this ministry break even. Now, a lot of people don't believe that, but that's the truth. We've got a $12,000 a month TV bill. Every month, we've got to pay, not $12,000 one time, $12,000 every month. And that's not high TV. High TV, we couldn't afford it. This is public access and lease access TV. And we couldn't afford the expensive TV just to be on Channel 17 would be about $1,500 for one 30-minute program. It's just more than we could afford. I hope somebody will come along and leave us $10 million so we go on TV, on regular TV all over the country. Because I would do that. I don't want more, don't want any more money for me we got five people on full-time salary. Dave, Mike, Tom, myself, and my wife. And Tom and Mary, my wife, they are, they do all the correspondence. I, if you call me, I'll have to give you to one of them because I don't know the Internet like Tom does. And I don't know our messages like Tom does. Call Tom. He'll tell you what you need. And uh, he knows what the messages are. So if you want DVDs, just call us. 1-800-625-5409. Or you can call locally, 615-824-8502. And uh, we do give away money to the poor and the needy, but not to all the poor and needy. The poor and needy people that prove themselves to us that they love the truth. And we give money to various people. I can't go into all of them. I go to the bank every first of the month. I'll be doing that this next week. And I get about $2,500 in cashier's checks from from 50 to $100 to couple of hundred dollars depending on how much they need and why I have to do a lot of investigating uh, just to, uh, let us know if you want free DVDs we give money to people like Robin Peters down in Amarillo she, we read one of her emails she's got leukemia she goes in and out of it and takes chemotherapy pills or something like that. Her her chemotherapy medicine runs $15,000 a month and her insurance pays for it, but uh, she only makes about $1,000 a month and after she pays close to $500 rent and a hundred and so dollars for utilities and a phone, she has not hardly anything left to live on. So so we send her money every month. But we, we're we also giving money to Danielle Thigpen. Danielle, Danielle Thigpen is a lady down in Louisiana. She's in Prairieville. And Danielle is a paraplegic. She had a wreck. 
back 15 years ago. She's 40 now. She had a wreck. She's when she's 25. She's driving to her mother's at night. And she said, I fell asleep and ran into a telephone pole and became paraplegic. She didn't know about all the programs that are available to her until I began to take up offerings for her to have a wheelchair accessible van. Those vans cost about $90,000. We've had people send money from all over the country, all over, uh, around the summer, from around the world. And she is, we've, we've got around $86,000. If you want to give any more, that's up to you. Everything that comes in will go to her. <coughs> I will not keep any of this for the church. None. It'll all go to her. It'll go to Van for her. But I've found out something since. If she goes to a government program, they'll pay for half the van. If they do, then the rest of that money will go to her so she can furnish an apartment. She's been living in a room in her father's house for 15 years staring at the walls watching my DVDs and she just said I'm so thankful I had that wreck I found out about predestination and the sovereignty of God and I'm just so thankful that I've come to the truth we love you Danielle and she has to go through a program to get she had to be assessed by her doctor this is a government program she has to go to this particular program for teaching her to drive one of these then after she learns how to drive then they'll get with the government the government will tell us how much they'll give to award the van and then we'll pay the rest of that and she'll have a van to drive and take her everywhere it's got on the side it's got you punch a button on a remote and this little uh a little step uh, it's just a little incline comes out to the ground she can drive her her uh, her wheelchair up there and take it up to the driver's area and there won't be a seat there and she can drive the van from it'll have the starter and the uh, the gas and the brake uh, it's a handle thing up on the steering wheel and she'll be able to drive it herself and they said they would get her a job and they would continue to increase her education if she wants it and the government would pay for it that's what we're going to wait for and that's what we're going to do so we love you Danielle uh, just uh, stay in touch with us and I'll be calling you probably tomorrow I call her about every two days just to keep up with her. And she said she appreciated that. Well, let's pray. Lord, thank you for the truth. I pray these people that call, that say this is the greatest message I've ever heard because of all the definition. Lord, help those people and teach them to continue in the word and the work. Fight all of our battles and we'll praise you in Christ's name. Amen. <coughs> All right, I'm ready to start. I don't see it anywhere. Oh, I see it. I'm sorry. So I unplugged it. I didn't think about it. Sorry about that. Okay. I need to put it over there to one of those. One of those maps of the Middle East. I like the maps. This is my favorite map right here. Right there. That's my favorite map. The reason 
and that's my favorite. I've, I've said it before. That is every bit of the land area of the Bible. That's why I like it. That's the land area. That's the Mediterranean Sea where the beast ruled. The beast was Babylon, Iraq, Persia, Iran, Greece, Greece, Rome, rising up out of the sea. And that's not even hard to understand. When most people look at that, the beast rising out of the sea in Revelation 13, wonder what this mysterious beast is. It's Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome. The Babylonian lion, the Persian, have you already said go? I started teaching. I'm sorry. I got you. Okay, 30 I'm Jim Brown, your Bible teacher at Grace and Truth Ministries. I'm trying to take you through the Bible, and particularly through a subject that people don't know anything about. They don't know anything about spiritual Israel, spiritual circumcision, spiritual daily cross. I've got this... I don't know what you'd call that. It's like a, it's like a, a page from some book with this written in here. We're talking about spiritual Israel. Let me erase this over here. I was saying something about this. Let me erase it. And what I've done, I've got a kind of a pinwheel. This is all about the sovereignty of God. When you look up sovereignty, sovereignty means all powerful. God has arranged everything in the Bible and in our lives to be what it is. He said so. He said he's declared, this is Isaiah 46 and 10. I've declared the end of time, the end of time, from the beginning, and everything that's not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I'll do all my pleasure, I'll do everything I want to do. On this pinwheel, you can see all these different things I've been teaching on. A blood baptism was a death. It's death to self. We know that. Baptize does not mean to dip into water or to sprinkle water. Baptize comes from two words, baptizo and bapto. Baptism means to cover. Baptism means to stain with a dye. The original word baptized didn't, was not a verb. Not a verb. Now, it looks like a verb. When you look it up in McClinic and Strong, look up baptize. You can get McClinic and Strong on the Internet. You can just uh, have your search engine look up Cyclopedia, Biblical, Theological, and Ecclesiastical Literature by John McClintock and James Strong. Just look up McClintock and Strong. That'll be enough. It'll give you every one of the volumes. Look up Baptize. It will tell Mr. Strong, who is the man who produced the Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, will tell you he's had probably several hundred contributors to make up this McClinic and Strong. Twelve-volume encyclopedia, one of the best sets of encyclopedias ever. They were researched between 1850 and 1885. And 
he will tell you that baptizo originally was not a verb implying motion. Now, you know what a verb is, don't you? It shows action. You have action verbs. And you have being verbs or helping verbs. Be, is, am, are, was, were, being, been, have, has, had, do, does, did, shall, will, should, would, may, might, must, can, could. That's the being verbs. All of it's a form of the verb to be. It means to exist. An action verb is like jump or run or throw. That's action. It shows action. But he says baptize to dip. That's not the word baptize. It didn't even mean that. Even Mr. Girdlestone, Robert Baker Girdlestone, one of the great Greek scholars of the last several hundred years, says it did not mean to dip into water or to immerse at all. It was a, it was, it was a infinitive. Now the way Mr. Strong says it, infinitive. An infinitive by any definition is not a verb, it is a noun. A noun is a person, place, or thing. This is a thing. You say, how can it look like a, uh, how can it look like a verb? Baptize sure looks like one, doesn't it? It looks like it's showing action, doesn't it? Sure it does. It's what it looks like, but it doesn't. It was an infinitive, which is a verbal noun. A verbal noun shows that there's an action coming up on a subject. You say, Jim, you said this before. I'm going to keep on saying it till you can say it in your sleep. There's an action coming up on the subject, and it's standing and dying it. And it, the action is coming from an outer source. That's coming from God. And that's the blood of Christ coming. He's washed us from our sins. The Bible says he's done the washing. Not some preachers dipping you in water. He's washed us from our sins in his own blood. That's in Revelation, the first chapter, verse 5 and 6. Revelation 1. And so the, the, the fluid is coming from an outer source upon the person and standing and dying him. It doesn't matter whether anybody likes or not. That's what it is. Mr. Girdlestone says the same thing, this great scholar. He says it was a household term that had a dual meaning. He said it was a word that women used to stain and dye clothes. What did they do? The... The translators of the King James Bible did not know what to do with the word baptize. So what they did, they want to make it easy on everybody and give them an error or give them a lie. So they simply turned this, they anglicized the word A-N-G-L-I-C-S-I-Z-E-D. They anglicized anglicized the word to anglicize means to make it an English word so they simply took this noun that had verbal character and turned it into a verb and you can't do that and every preacher in America's done that they think they well it looks good to me so we're going to dip people in water there's one Lord one faith and one Baptism. It is blood. It is not H2O. H2O has nothing to do with baptize. I should know I've been dipped by my father about five times and another two preachers uh, twice there. So I know it confused me from the time I was a kid. So baptize is something that God does. And it's with blood, not water. So, this all shows the sovereign, all power of God. Every one of these. We have to drink the cup. Jesus asked James and John, can you drink the cup that I drink of? He prepares the cup because the cup 
is the same thing as tribulation, trial. He's the one that puts us through tribulation. What is he doing when he's doing all this? He's getting rid of, we keep talking about an inner and an outer man. He's circumcising us over the years with tribulation and trials. That comes from the hands of evil men. See, when you're going through tribulation and trials, don't complain. God is getting rid of you. That's our problem. We got one problem. It's called self. That's actually what a demon is, is self. This is all about every one of these subjects here are about increasing and decreasing. God will either increase or decrease. Self has to decrease. And faith must increase. Faith is death to self. So if faith increases, I've got each one of these subjects up here. If you've got faith increasing, I've got dozens of areas that I have to go into that to show you faith increasing. And faith is death to self. Let me put it on the board again. Death to self. That's what faith is. Faith is believing in somebody else other than you believing in yourself. You say, I don't know how to save myself. Well, good. I don't know how to save myself either. But God will save me. I keep going back to the word no. All these preachers I would raise around, they say, if you don't know you're saved, absolutely, positively sure, you'll probably die and go to hell one day. That's a lie. you got two words for no. You have the word gnosko. Let me move this over here. I'm going to need that side of the board because I'm going to leave these things up here. I've been thinking about this a long time. This is all about... This is all about spiritual circumcision. I think I've got it right here. All this is about who is it that circumcises us? The Bible says God will circumcise you over there in Deuteronomy. So this is all about the will of God, about God's sovereign will and everything that's going on. There, you, we have to die. We have to... Self has to die. Death to self. Death to self. To self. Must. Increase. So that. Christ. In us. Will increase. Our faith will increase. Faith will increase. The more, the stronger our faith becomes. People say, well, you get enough faith as soon as you're born again. Well, you get enough faith to go to heaven, but you only get enough faith to be strong in this life because you've got two men in you. You've got I didn't say this. The Apostle Paul said this. If you don't like this, take it up with him when you get to heaven, if you get there. You got an outer man. He says this in Romans 7. He says, you got an outer man that serves the law of the flesh. Everywhere you've got flesh in the Bible that's seeking self, that has to go. And then you have an inner man, which is the new, the new birth. That's Jesus Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's Christ. And that's, we were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. You can't conceive yourself anymore. You could conceive yourself to be born when you first come to the knowledge of Christ. You can't conceive yourself. Your mother and father had to conceive you, and it was a work of God in their womb, in her womb. It wasn't your doing, wasn't your father's doing, or your mother's doing. 
So when you're born again, you're born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Bible says in James 1.18, of his own will beget he us. To beget means to birth inside of you, conceive himself in you. Well, there's Christ in you, and there's that serves the law of God. And there is that serves God's law, and the inner and the outer man serves the law of the flesh, and that's death to self. Death to self is the outer man has to die, and it takes two witnesses. That's why you don't want to die to the flesh when you're young. You've got too many hormones. You've got too many physical desires. And God says, that has to die. So it might take you till you're 70 or 80 years old for self wants to really give up. And when you get to be 80 and you're a believer, you don't seem to care about the flesh much anymore. I don't. I'm 83. I know I'll be dead probably at the very most in 10 years. I live to be 93. I don't want to live to be 99 or 100. My mother died at 99. I don't want to be that old. She was completely infirmed when she died. She couldn't get up. She couldn't move. I don't want to live like that. And but Jim, are you feeling sorry for yourself? No. I want to go, I want to leave this body and go be with the Lord. So you said a while ago, Jim, faith has to increase. The apostles come to Jesus and say, Lord, increase our faith. Increase faith. Increase our faith. Well, Jesus tells them how their faith has increased. He said, if a servant goes out and works all day long, and he comes into the house, and his master's there, he doesn't feed himself. He goes to his master and feeds him, and then he turns to himself and says, I am an unprofitable servant. That's how your faith is increased. Self has to die from the scene. You realize you're not important. What is is Christ and others and not you. Boy, that takes a long time to get there. Well, I keep telling you, faith is one of the most interesting equations. It's, it's like an uh, algebra equation. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. hoped for. Now, substance, you could say faith equals substance because is has the same meaning as equals. Faith equals substance of things hoped for. Substance is the word. Here's what faith is. Hupo stasis. That's what it is. Hupo means under or sub. Any number of people will tell you it means sub. A submarine means under the marine or under the water. Substasis, understanding. Substand, a substanding is Something that causes a structure to stand is a foundation. So that's another word for substance, a foundation. So what we build on is the foundation, which is faith. But you've got to remember, there's none that seeketh after God. None seeketh God. There's none righteous, not one. None righteous. This is before you come to truth. None righteous. And Paul is talking about Jew and Gentile in the world when he says that. None righteous. Therefore, if you have faith, faith is the gift of God. 
God's gift. And that word gift is not a present that's wrapped up with a bow on it. That's not it. The word gift there in Ephesians 2.8 is the word doron, D-O-R-O-N. Doron means a sacrifice. So God has to put the desire in our hearts to sacrifice our bodies, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, reasonable logikos. Logikos is our word logical. It comes from logos, which is the Greek word word. It's our word service, and the logos is the word of God. So, Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Substance is understanding. I've said this so many times. Understanding means you are learning. You are a learner. Learner is the word mathetes. In the Greek. That's the word disciple. Do you have to learn? Well, yeah. How are you going to obey if you don't learn? And the Bible says you cannot be a disciple without he that beareth not his cross and followeth after me cannot be my disciple. You cannot learn and you have no faith. So where do you get a cross from? You have to be condemned in the first century. You had to be condemned to a cross. Only slaves and criminals could be put on a cross. If you're a Roman citizen, you couldn't die of a cross death. So, in order to have a cross, people ask me so many times, what is a daily cross? Well, you have to be condemned to it. Who's going to condemn you? People that you tell the truth to, you witness to. You tell them about predestination. And you say, the Bible says, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. That means to be on that needs to be on this pinwheel. Predestination. Because that is the will of God that we conform to his image. Everything that I put on this pinwheel, everything has to do with God's will to either bring you, to cause you to increase dying daily or to decrease self in some fashion. Some guy put that up on the, that he gave me this board thing and it's, I don't know how to put this up here. I'm going to need more space. Let me erase some of this and I'll put it here, up here. This is how things have to work in your life and in mine. And every bit of it's the will of God. It's like so. Wait a minute. It has to be like this. Faith. You start off with little faith. Little faith. And faith has to grow. Yeah, what you they can't see that. They can't see that. It has to be like this. Faith has to grow as you live. And self has to decrease as you live. 
And that's the way it works with this inner and this outer man. Self is in charge when you first come to the knowledge of Christ and you are a baby believer. People say, there's no such thing as a baby believer. Are you kidding? Look at 1 Corinthians, the third chapter. Paul said, you're babies, you're babes, and you need to be growing, and you're not. You're sitting arguing with each other. And Paul speaks of babes in Christ, and you have to grow up. He said, strong meat belongs to those who are full age. Full age means grown up. Full age is the word teleos, T-E-L-E-I-O-S. That's the same word as perfect when Jesus said, be therefore perfect as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Be grown up, be mature. And if you're a baby, you you need of milk and not strong meat. Strong meat, teleos, means meat that's for mature grown up people that's got teeth in their mouth. You should be grown up, but he said you're not. It says that in Hebrews the fifth chapter and Hebrews the sixth chapter. So we're talking about faith. If you don't have faith is understanding that equals disciple, that equals a daily cross. You cannot be following Christ with a daily cross unless you have have understanding. Faith is a substance, uh, hypostasis, understanding. Understanding learns as a learner or disciple, and that takes a daily cross. You have to have death to self, and God has to cause that to come about in you. When I first started witnessing, I was a young guy in my 20s. I'd go up to somebody and talk to them about the Lord, and I didn't know none of these things. I was just kind of an ignorant young guy. My heart would start pounding. <sighs> And I would talk, try to talk fast and over, talk over them. It's not the way to witness. Everybody out there that you see in the world, everybody, every person you see on TV, in a movie, in a sports uh, activity, everybody is already a vessel of wrath or a vessel of mercy, which God has before prepared to glory or to destruction. Everybody. You're not going out there trying to find goats to turn into sheep. You're looking for God's elect sheep that are lost. All sheep that are lost will come to him. Jesus said, all that the Father giveth me is mine, they'll come to me. And they'll, they will come. So when you're witnessing, all you've got to do is tell somebody truth. That's it. Don't expect a lot. Because many are going to go into the broad way that leads to destruction. And few, a puny number, are going to find the truth. So most of the people you witness to won't believe anything. Have you noticed that? They will just look at you with a dumb look. That's because they don't belong to God. Does that get depressing? Well, yeah. Does it depress me? Yeah. But I keep going because I know there's some sheep out there. I had a fellow call me from Florida yesterday, and his name was uh, Estrada. I said, I, there was another guy, movie actor named Estrada. He said, yeah, that was Eric Estrada. I said, yeah, I remember him. His name was Estrada. I can't remember his first name. But he, he said, I have never seen anyone teach like you in my life. I've never seen anybody give all those definitions and say the things you say. He says, this is such a thrill to me to find these truths. He just was so overwhelmed he didn't want to get off the phone. I'm going to send him a lot of DVDs, but he just, he loves the truth. Boy, when you find somebody like that, that, I told him, I said, this is a thrill to me to hear these words from you. He said, I've been watching you several months. And he said, I just can't get over what you're teaching. It's not like any preacher I've ever heard. It's because of the definitions. I don't care what the Baptists teach or the Church of Christ or the Pentecostals. I don't care nothing about their tongues. I have studied that for decade after decade, and there's no such thing as Pentecostal tongues. There's no such thing as faith healing. It's all a 100% lie.
What really gets me, I told this fellow yesterday, I said, how can there be faith healing? Every famous faith healer that's been real famous in the last hundred years, every one of them have died of a disease. Now, how can old Roberts be have faith healing when he died of a heart attack? He died of cardiac disease. I was telling my just this yesterday I said every time the Bible I told him I said every time the Bible says thy faith has made thee whole every time the word whole is sozo and it means saved I said there's no such thing as faith healing you know that you're a doctor he said I know that he wanted to kind of reinforce my understanding of what he knew he said I know that I said I said when people die of old age, they die of some disease. They have a pulmonary disease, a cardiac disease. You know that. He said, yes, I know that. Like he wanted to make sure that I knew that he knew it. I just simply was saying, every doctor knows when you die. I use the word natural causes. I said, you die of a disease. And I said, Oral Roberts died of, of a heart, heart disease, of a heart attack. I, excuse me. Oral Roberts died of pneumonia. Well, I said, why didn't he call Jesse Duplantis to come in or Benny Hinn to come pray for him and heave him off of his deathbed? I said, Jan Crouch, the purple-haired woman with TBN, died of a heart attack connected with, with a stroke. And her husband, who started TBN, he wrestled with, with congestive heart failure for the last 10 years of his life. Where do you get all that information, Jim? Off the Internet, they'll tell you how they died. And Kenneth Hagin, who started the positive confession movement here in the world and said, all you have to do is sit with your mouth and you get it. He died of a heart attack. What do you mean, faith healing? They didn't have to die. I just called Benny Hinn. He'll come pray over him. I've watched on TV how the old Cheyenne uh, cowboy, Clint Walker, he went to one of Benny Hinn's crusade, and Benny Hinn was supposed to heal him, but he didn't, and Clint died anyway. And a lot of those famous people go to him. Uh, the big ex-boxer, uh, retired boxer. Holyfield. Huh? Holyfield. What? Holyfield. Yeah, Evander Holyfield went to a Benny Hinn crusade to heal him. Found out that Holyfield didn't have the sickness that he thought he had, but Benny Hinn took credit for healing him. And Evander Holyfield's going to die of a disease someday if he don't get killed in a car wreck or something. Everybody's going to die of a disease. Welcome to the world. Now, so faith has to have a daily cross. You have to be dying. And how often do you need a cross? Every day. Paul said, I die daily. You're either talking about one of these is increasing. Death to self has to increase. Spiritual circumcision has to be a cutting off and a death to all of these sins that we're involved in. Daily cross has to be every day. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. Deny aperneomai. Aperneomai means to contradict. And the Bible says he has to do that daily. And where does that come from? It comes from God. You don't have the strength to do that. Paul said how to perform that which is good. I don't know how. How to perform that which is good I find not. And he said the thing in me. When I do those things that I would not. It's no more I that do it. But sin. The outer man that dwells in me. And he said there's two men in me. In Romans 7.25. 725. He said, there's the man, there's the inner man that serves the law of God and the outer man that serves the law of the flesh. He serves his sin. How are you going to get away from that as long as you live it? 
in this body, this body has to wear out to get away from this outer man. You can't do that when you're young. When you're full, you when you're vibrant, and you're full of, uh, you're full of vim and vigor, and you want that woman or that man or that car or that house or that money or that job. When you want all these things, you have to die to that. I used to, in my sixties, I remember the last car that I wanted. You ever wanted a car? Huh? Now don't lie to me. <laughs> if if it's if it's common to me, it's common to you. I remember the last time I saw a red Jeep, those big long Jeeps. It had the back on it, four door, and they had the doors off. And I thought, boy, that is really cool. I'd like to have one of them. Did you know I was about sixty five then? And I don't want one of those now. Do do more than I can fly. I don't want one. That's the last time I wanted a car. I bought a brand new 87 town car in 1987. It was the prettiest town car I've ever seen. And after about six months, you know what it was? It was a car. That's all it was. After about six months. Well, that's my car out there. It used to be real pretty, but just a car now. That's all it becomes. You cannot fill up the flesh. The Bible says, He that loves silver will not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance will increase. When goods are increased, they are increased that eat them. The more you get, the more you want. I'm sorry, that's the way it is. You say, how can I get over this want to? This man here has to die. Takes a lifetime to get rid of him. You will a little bit at a time as you grow older. You know what a brand new house is after about eight months or nine months? It's just, it's a house. That's all it is. It's just a house. It doesn't mean nothing. You know the greatest thrill I ever got was when I bought my first house. It was a little bitty tiny house, about a thousand square feet. And I said, I can dig a hole in my own yard. I can do whatever I want to. I can scream and shout. And this is the greatest feeling. I thought, I'll never feel this again, and I never have. Never have felt that way since. It was a thrill to have my own place. Me and Mary had the first house that I had ever bought. Now, let me say some of these things to you. This outer man is the fleshly man. Let me show you what the Bible says about that man. Flesh is the word sarks. I know how men are. Young men cannot fulfill their sexual desires. There's just no way you can do it. That's why he needs a wife if he can possibly find one. There's no way out of it. How do you know that, Jim? Because I was a young man. Now I'm an old man. You can't get rid of all your flesh. There's just no way. Look over here in Romans. i got to read this. I read this to you a couple weeks ago. Go to Romans, the 8th chapter, or the 7th chapter, actually. We'll start with this seventh chapter. The seventh chapter of Romans, and we'll look at the last verse. The last verse, verse 25. He's just talked about things that I would do, I, I don't want to do. That's because I, he said, I got two men in me. They're wrestling with one another. Then he said, O wretched man that I am, in verse 24. It says in the original text, O wretched man, it is me. It, it didn't use past tense. Some preachers try to get out of this by saying, Oh, that's what he used to be. No, no, no. He says, It is me. Who shall deliver me from the body of me? This is a living death I'm in. 
who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. That's that fleshly man, that outer man that I want to get rid of. You won't get rid of all of it till the day you die. You'll go through tribulation and trials down here. God will have to scourge you. The word mastix is the word scourge. It was a bloody beating. Mastix. That's the word scourge in Hebrews 12. Scourge, mastix. It was a... God says, I'm going to beat my children with a mastix. It was a short leather whip that had pieces of glass and bone in it. And it was a bloody whipping. And God says, that's why I'm going to beat my children. I'm going to get rid of that outer man. I'm going to make you give up. You know why you have all these problems of tribulation and trial? I'm going to tell you why you have them. This is not even hard to understand. It's because you want to run with people that don't agree with God you get around the wrong people they'll beat you and David said that's the sword of the Lord deliver me from the wicked which is thy sword the sword in a sense equates with that little circumcision knife that they'd circumcise a boy with and that's why I said circumcision there's death to the outer man and it has to increase. Circumcision has to increase in the sense that it's cutting off. You can just say these concentric circles is God's concircumcising you because he's cutting off all desire for self. And if you can get old enough, you'll get to where you don't even want the things that you used to want. That's what Ecclesiastes, the 12th chapter says, Now remember thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no more pleasure in the days of my youth. Y'all have heard me say this a hundred times. I do not want to go to the fair. Is that understood? Mary said, let's go to the fair. I say, no. Well, let's just go and look at the exhibits. I'll do that, but I will not go down the fairway. There's no, you cannot pay me $100 an hour to walk down the fairway. No, I will not go. Boy, I want to go to the bear fair so bad when I was 15. I'd do anything to go. I don't like it now. It's just a bunch of con men trying to get money off of you. Say, throw this basketball, see how easy it is, and they got a little ball that big, and it'll go right in. Then when they hand one to you, it's this big, and it won't go in. <laughs> That's exactly what they do. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> and they'll go at it, be throwing it in over and over. And when it comes your turn, they reach under there and hand you one. That there's no way it'll go in. All right. You think I'm joking? I'm not kidding you. That's exactly what they do. And it's to make money. Now, where did I say I was going? Over here. No, I'm not going to Ecclesiastes 12. I'm going back here to Romans, the eighth, the eighth chapter. After he says, I keep saying this. Maybe you didn't get it yet. Whenever something says Romans 8 and 1, Romans 8, and one, forget one and forget eight. That's not in the text. They go straight from chapter seven into straight in chapter eight. All of their books were written in a scroll. They didn't have eight one. They only put that in there for us so we can find what we're looking for. So you, you can't come up and say uh, that these are not connected. When it goes into next verse, which is chapter 8, verse 1, there is therefore, there is therefore, therefore is a conjunction saying, what I just said, I'm fixing to tell you things that's related to what I just said in chapter 7. There is therefore no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, the outer man, but after the spirit, the inner man. He's still on the same subject. You get that? Can you see that? 
For the law of the spirit of the life in Christ Jesus, talking about that inner man, hath made me free from the law of sin, the outer man. But he dies hard. And what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh of the outer man, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh for sin, condemned sin in the flesh in the outer man. And then he goes on to say, he goes on to say, for in verse 5, in verse 5, for they that are after the outer man, it's his flesh, but he's still talking about the outer man. They that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. Is your mind on flesh or is on God? But they that are after the spirit, the things of the of the inner man. He stays right in the context of everything. For to be carnally, sarkikos, S-A-R, K-I-K-O-S. It means fleshly. It comes from the word flesh. To be fleshly or to be following the desires of the outer man. For to be carnally minded. He's still on the same subject. To be fleshly minded is death. Eventually you'll die. And that outer man is going to die anyway. But to be spiritually minded like the inner man is life and peace. I never realized when I was young that I could have as much peace as I have today. I'm really a peaceful man. I'm weak. I'm old. I got all these aches and pains. And they're increasing every day. But I got peace in my life. I'm not trying to go out here and find the right job or buy the right car. or I, don't, I just don't care about those things anymore. I buy whatever Mary does not want. If she doesn't want a car that she bought, she's had several of them she didn't want after she bought them. She said, you need to take that. I said, okay. And I'll take the car you're driving. I said, it's fine with me. Sometimes she'll say, drive that RAV so I can, it needs some gas. And I'll say, okay. I just, I don't really care what I drive. If I can get there. You know what a car is for for me? You get from point A to point B, that's it. It's not to show off anymore. It used to be. Because the carnal mind, if you're thinking with the outer man, that outer man is enmity against God. It's at war with God. Enmity is the word ekthra, E-C-H-T-H-R-A. Hostile. The outer man, the one that goes after the flesh, that wants the car you want, the house you want, the girl you want, the man you want, it's hostile to God. Whew. Well, that, that's the same word in James 4 and 4. Know you not that friendship with the world is enmity against God? Whosoever be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Enmity is that word, ekthra. If you're friends with the world to get the things you want, you're at war with God. Boy, that's tough, isn't it? And when you get at war with God, what's he going to do? He's going to pick up some lightning bolts and hit you with them. He's got a bigger, he's got a bigger arsenal than you can possibly come up with. And then he goes on to say, For it is not subject, because the carnal mind is at war with God, for it is not subject to the law of God, which is the inner man, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the outer man, flesh, cannot please God. You can never be pleasing to God if you're living for the flesh and not for the Lord. I've lived so much for my flesh in my life. If you're just saying, I gotta have a woman, I gotta have a man, I gotta have this, I gotta have that, I gotta have the car, I gotta have money, I gotta, that's the only thing that'll make me happy, then you're at war with God. 
But you're not in the flesh, that outer man, but in the spirit, the inner man. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you, the inner man, he doesn't leave the subject of the previous chapter all the way through this. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ as the inner man, you don't belong to God. He's none of his. When the Charismatics and Pentecostals say, well, the Holy, gift, Holy Spirit is a second gift of grace. No, it's not. This here says you have to have the Spirit in order to be a child of God. The Holy Spirit's truth. And it's written in the hearts of the believers. If Christ be in you. Boy, that matches up with that 25th verse of the previous chapter, doesn't it? Christ in you is this man in the middle of you. And he's the man that doesn't sin. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. And he cannot sin because he's born of God. Every one of these things is the power of God is in it. Drinking a cup is death to self. To self. Blood baptism is death to self. Faith increasing is death to self. John said, Besides all this, God of diligence, add to your faith. Add to faith. And he named seven things. Or add to your understanding. And he starts off with virtue. Arete. A-R-A-T-E. Which means maturity. How long is it going to take to add virtue and for you to grow up? 40 years? 50 years? Going to take a long time. Don't think I have arrived. I'm listening to Jim. Let me tell you a secret. I haven't arrived yet. I battle this flesh every day. He gives me a hard time. Every once in a while, somebody cut me off in traffic, and I'll go, oh, boy, you know what I want to do. Lord, forgive me for rising up. Just because somebody cuts me off. I know God had him do that to remind me death to self. And then he says, if the spirit, if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit of life, that's the inner man because of righteousness. Righteousness is in the inner man. Dikaya usune comes from DK, which is the word right. The only thing that will make you do right is because you got the inner man. Right is a form of righteous. Righteous, D I K A I O S U N E. It's because God Christ is in you that you want to do right, not according to the the flesh wants to leap out, and it don't matter. Have you ever noticed that things that were real important 10 years ago are not important now? The anger that you exhibited 15, 20 years ago, it, you're thinking, what was I mad at then? I didn't have any right being that way, and you didn't. Not as a believer. And then he says... If the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, that's the inner man, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken, quicken, zumpa'o, your mortal bodies. He's not just going to quicken you spiritually. Z. O O P O I E O. He's going to make alive the mortal body, the physical body you live in. The word mortal is a word that means in the sense of one who has dying in his future. Let me see here. I've got that word written down. I've forgotten what it is. I'll tell you what it is. Here it is right here. That word mortal is the word thanetos, T-H-N-E-T-O-S. The word mortal is T-H-N-E-T-O-S. 
That word mortal doesn't mean your spiritual body when he comes back to take you out of here. That's not what it's talking about. It means liable to die. The body that's liable to death, the mortal one, the physical one, is liable to death, then that's the one he's going to quicken, the one you're walking around in. But if he quickens, he makes it alive. You quicken means to make, to come to life after dying. Well, anastasis, with the word resurrection, means to come to life after dying, and we have to die daily. And we have to die in this mortal body to the flesh and give up the things that this flesh wants. And he goes on to say, if we, verse 13, he says in verse 12, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the outer man to live after the flesh. If we live after the outer man, the flesh, ye shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify, kill off, necrao. Kill off. We think of necromancy as talking to the dead. Kill off. Necromancy is talking to the dead. Necro is a form of necromancy. It means to kill off. You got to kill off that outer man. And that's not an invitation. God's saying, Wouldn't you like to kill it off? He demands you kill it off. And you will in time. How much time do I have, Mike? I'm not going to get to all these guys on the board because I've got to go. Well, let's finish this. If we live after the outer man, you shall die. But if you through the spirit do kill off the deeds of the body of the outer man, you'll live. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, the inner man, they are the sons of God. You have to be led by the Spirit, which is the truth. John 14, 15, 16, John 15, 26, John 16, 13, 1 John 5 and 6. The Spirit is the truth. John 17, 17, thy word is truth. You've got to be living according to the word of God, this book. I don't hear any preachers talking about that. I've got all these verses written down on how we have to obey God, obey the Spirit, obey the faith. All through the Old Testament, God says you have to be obedient to me. I'll read them to you one day. If you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, who else will see you? H-U-I-O-T-H-E-S-I. This is adoption. H-U-I-O-T-H-E-S-I-A. It's that same word in, in Ephesians 1 and 5. Uh, having predestinated us unto the adoption. That has to do with predestination. We've been predestinated to be adopted as children. It comes from huios, H-U-I-O-S, and tithemai. It means to place, T-I-T-H-E-M-I. Tithemai means to place sons. And sons being sons, we can't live the way we want. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. We have to live godly and righteously. You say, that sounds awful self-righteous. No, righteous means to be right. Godly means the, it means the, means the, it's the word Eusebia. A-U-S-E-B-E-I-A. -E -E. This is the word godly. I love the way one of the writers put it. He said, it's the resurrection scheme. Resurrection scheme of things. The only reason your resurrection is you're dying daily. S C H S C H E M E. It's the resurrection. Resurrection's anastasis means to come to life after dying. That's godly living, dying daily. Do you really know what that means? Next time you're gonna do something you shouldn't do. Say, I shouldn't do this. I need to back away. This is what I want to do. This is what my flesh wants to do, but I can't do this. And walk away from it. 
Do I think anybody here has that problem? I think everybody has that problem. The reason is I'm a man and there's no temptation taking you, but this this is common to me. I'm a man and I have admitted, Lord. I'll tell you, have you ever prayed the prayer, Lord, this is a sin that I really like. Would you deliver me from this evil and go against your own desires? You ever prayed that prayer? I pray that often. Lord, let me go against my flesh. That's hard. That's a hard place to come to, isn't it? I'm trying to tell you how preachers should tell the people. You know, if the preacher would tell the people in these churches what temptations they have, then people wouldn't feel so guilty when he told them what they had to repent of, would they? So the preacher says he's a human just like the rest of us. Well, he is. I don't care how righteous he looks. I don't care what kind of three-piece suit he has on, and he's got a real pretty gold watch fob on. And you look at David Jeremiah, and he's tall, and he's got premature gray hair, and he says some of the stupidest things I've ever heard a preacher say. But he looks good, and he sounds real religious. There's things he just does not know. If he doesn't know these things, he's not living them. Or John MacArthur, one of the guys I pick on more than anybody. I don't pick on John because I don't like him. I pick on him because I did like him so much. In the early 80s, I was listening to him all the time, and I got kept listening closer and closer and closer. And he has so much error in his teaching. And I believe he's a Christian. I believe he's a believer. But I believe he just does not want to give up some things that he's been teaching ever since he went to Grace Community Church because he's going to embarrass himself because he's been teaching them for 50 years. And he can't say, I've been wrong on Christmas. I've been wrong on baptism. He knows what Christmas is. He says so. He knows it's the feast of Saturn. He knows Mithra's birthday is December the 25th, the chief son god of Rome. He knows all of this. He knows baptism is not water. He said so. I've heard him say that on radio if we baptize people the way we should we'd put them under the water we wouldn't let them up that's your words john and and i don't know why he says the things he says he's he's lived in some of this why does he not see last trump I've heard so many of these preachers quote Romans, uh, quote 1 Corinthians 51 and 52. Behold, I show you the mystery. We shall not all sleep. We shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkle of an eye. And they, they end right there. And they never say, at the last trump. Boy, that just goes all over me when they won't say, at the last trump. Seven trumpets sound in Revelation 8, 9, and 10. When the seventh one sounds, the mystery of God, the church is finished, it's complete. And Christ has got one full on the land, the other on the sea, and says, time is no more. There's no more rat. There's no more tribulation after the last trump. There is no more millennium, thousand years. It's not in the Bible in the original text. I don't know why they insist. John has never said anything about last trump. I never heard him. I don't believe he even knows it's there. If he knows it's there, he doesn't want to deal with it. I've been really disappointed in you, John. I don't know if you ever watched me. I hope you watch this. I hope God will teach you. I'm men, John, man, you're the same age. I'm a month older than you. I probably started studying about the same time as you when I was 17. I just don't know why you're saying some of the things you're saying because I believe he's a... I believe he's a godly man to a degree but he's got a lot of error in his teaching why you do that I don't know now if you'll notice all these things go together all of them denying self is daily denies the word aparneoma it means to utterly contradict if you utterly contradict yourself, do you do that one time? No. <laughs> if you confess Christ, 
confess. Confess means to be of the same word, of the same, of the same word. It means to agree with. Homo legao. Homo means of the same. L O G E O. You're walking down the aisle and confessing Christ is not a one time deal. You go out in the world and you agree with everything that God said and you start trying to have a daily cross. To drink of a cup meant to undergo a death. And blood baptism was undergoing a death. Faith increasing some of my favorite verses for Second Peter 1 and 5 says add to your faith. But when it says add, epikoregeo, E-P-I-C-H-O-R-E-G-E-O, that is an imperative mood in the Greek. And if God inspired Peter to write that word, that's God saying, I require that you add to your faith. And he names seven things. Seven. Seven is the number of divine refinement for the church. I want to go over there and look at that, but just look, all these things go together on this pinwheel. The spiritual Sabbath, unbelief must decrease. When you get into the spiritual Sabbath, I need to put worship on here. I heard MacArthur teach on worship for a week on radio and he never defined the word not one time he said if we're going to worship let me give you this these are some notes I've had for years the common word worship has to do with predestination the word is proskuneo P R O S. K-U-N-E-O. Let me put it over here. It has to do with God's sovereignty, being in control of everything. This is the word worship. P-R-O-S-K-U-N-E-O. It comes from pros and kuon, K U. O N. Pros means toward. And Qan is the word hound. It's the word hound. And what it has the idea of, the writers will tell you, it means to go before the head dog. Like in wolf packs, you'll have an alpha male. That's the leader of the pack. The rest of the dogs cannot breed unless he says so. The rest of the dogs cannot eat unless he gives his permission. They can do nothing. I've got a picture of a wolf pack on one of my t-shirts. And it shows all of these other males coming around to the male and saying, whatever can I eat or whatever you want me to have. That's what worship is about. Whatever you want me to have, God. You don't ask God for anything, anything. That would go along with the word ask. That would be just like predestination. You're bound to whatever God wants. You're bound to all of these things here. That's worship. It's not what men think. I don't know why John never did, never why he never said anything about that he taught for a week on worship he said we need to worship worship in a holy way and worship a godly way and he's using these English words and he doesn't say nothing John I'm disappointed in you it's like a dog licking his master's hand to fawn or couch before him and prostrate oneself in homage to reverence and to adore him. It means to lick the hand or to flatter him. Lord, whatever you want me to have. It doesn't say, God, give me a car. 
let me eat. It just bows to God is what it does. To all of his wills. Spiritual circumcision. You've got an increasing debt to self. You go to those seven things. It increases the spiritual Sabbath. Look over here in, in Hebrews, the third chapter. Do I have any time, Mike? 24. Huh? 24. 24. Okay. Hebrews, the second chapter, uh, the third chapter, excuse me. Hebrews, third chapter. So, Hebrews, third chapter goes along with all these other things. The Sabbath is resting after you give up this outer man. You can rest. But you can't rest completely. Rest has to do with obeying God. Obey God. When you learn all of these things that He's put out before us, when you've learned them, even demon, demonion, distribute fortunes. When you learn to quit distributing fortunes to self, that's all a demon is, is you. When you learn, we're not, I'm not saying don't work hard and don't make plans for your life. I'm not saying that. I'm saying be responsible on your job, work hard, but don't overwork. How do you know that? I overworked in real estate till I got myself in the hospital. I was knocking on the hospital door for years. I'd worked 80, 85, up to 90 hours every week. And I got to thinking one time, that only makes me, when you put all that together after I paid all my advertisement, I was only making about 10 or $12 an hour. I got to thinking, that is stupid. Just because I can work three jobs, it doesn't mean that's what I'm supposed to do. And that's what working 85 and 90 hours a week is doing. It's like working three jobs around the clock. Now, look here in Hebrews 3. Hebrews, the third chapter. All through this third and fourth chapter, he's talking about resting. Kataposis is the word. This is what you do on the Sabbath. You do this. You do kataposis. Kata. Pauses. That's a word that would be like the labor you do on a Sabbath day equals Sabbath. Sabbath, sabbaton does not mean seventh. It never does. Sabbaton means rest. And kata pauses means to pause down. Kata means down. It means rest. You stop. These people that are Seventh-day worker, workers, they've never looked at Exodus 16, where all the people on the Sabbath in Israel, they had to go to their tent, lay down, and do nothing all day long. That was it. They didn't go listen to some Seventh-day preacher preach. They had to go home. They couldn't light any fires. If you are a seventh-day person, you drive into a restaurant having some guy break your Sabbath to cook for you. They couldn't carry anything. They couldn't ride a mule, and you're going to get in your car and ride. You couldn't do that. They couldn't do much of anything. They couldn't have any entertainment. If you watch, if you're a seventh-day worshiper, and you, and you watch a football college football on Saturday you're breaking your own Sabbath you can't have entertainment on your Sabbath but in this it's mentioned all through here it's talking about 
the people of Israel, when they were out in the wilderness, they could not enter into the Sabbath, which God called the promised land, because of their unbelief. They couldn't enter into the Sabbath because of a p i s t i s. Pistis is the word faith. The alpha primitive in front of that negates it. Means no faith because they they argued with God about going into into the land of the Anakims. The men of Anak were real tall men, and they said, "We cannot go in there and whip them. They're too tall. They're big." And the land of Anak was on the southwest corner of Israel. Here's Israel, and over here is Egypt, and here's the Red Sea right here. And God had conquered the greatest army in the world at that time when He drowned Pharaoh's and his armies in the Red Sea. Then when they go down here to Sinai, and then they come up here to Kadesh Barnea and tells the men twenty years old and upward to spies to go in and spy out the land of Anak, which is the land that we call the land of the. It was the land of the Philistines. It's the Palestinians here. And those were giant men. They said, we can't conquer them. God says, just because of your unbelief, unbelief, I'm not going to let you enter into the promised land, which he called the Sabbath. Because they did not, and it was because of their unbelief, they couldn't enter into Katapasis. And, that, and when you look at this third chapter, he says, they cannot enter into my rest because of their unbelief. He says, he says that in the third chapter, in verse 18, to whom swear he that they could not enter into his rest, into his catapulses, but to them that believe not. When you believe, the way you enter into a Sabbath, you believe everything that God's doing that's all preordained by God in your life. Even the bad things. You say the evil comes from God. You lose something in your life, it's from God. You say, but that was evil men that had come up against me. God raised them up against you. They're evil men. They're vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. And he raises them up to whip his people with. And he says in verse 19, So we see they could not enter in because of apistus, no belief that God could conquer the Anakims because he had destroyed the largest army in the world at that time. Pharaoh and his armies. And then he says in chapter 4, Let us therefore fear lest a promise be left us of entering into his catapasis. He equates catapasis with the Sabbath. Any of you should come short of it. And then he says in verse 3, For we which have believed do enter into catapasis, rest. And then he says, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my catapasis, my rest. And he says in verse 4, For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did catapasis, rest, the seventh day. He equates with the rest with the seventh day, the catapasis. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my catapasis. And then he gets down here to verse 8. For if Jesus had given them catapasis rest, then would he not afterwards have spoken of another day? This next verse is very interesting. There remaineth therefore the rest of to the people of God. That word rest is not katapasis. It's the word sabbatismos. He equates the katapasis with sabbatismos. Katapasis equals 
sabbatees must. What you have to do, you got to believe God can take care of your enemies just like he said, I can take care of those men of Anak. I don't care who your enemies are and how big they are. But you got to quit running around with them and what quit running with the wrong people. What's interesting is the next couple of verses. For he that is entered into God's cataposis has ceased, ceased. He stopped his cataposis, his own works, his own ergon. And how do you quit your own works? In Galatians, the fifth chapter, this is what you got to quit to enter into the spiritual Sabbath. And God's going to put you through all kinds of tribulation. We must have much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. It, with great difficulty we enter the kingdom, according to the first Peter, the fourth chapter. Great difficulty. This tribulation we go through is for our good. And look over here in Galatians. So he that he that has entered into God's rest has ceased from his own ergon. And over here in Galatians, the fifth chapter, the Bible says, the works of the flesh. Oh, we're back to that outer man. The works of the outer man, let's put it where it is. The works of the flesh or the outer man are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, being just not stable, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in the time past, that they that do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Remember the kingdom of God was Israel? If I were the if I were the finger of God cast out devils, cast out Daemonion. Oh, there's the demons self. If I were the finger of God cast out devils, then the kingdom if I were the finger of God cast out devils, then the kingdom of God is coming to you. But if you're practicing all these things with the outer man, God says, I won't let that man come into the kingdom. And then he says, but the fruit of the inner man. Oh, that's what he says. The fruit of the Spirit. The Spirit is the inner man. The fruit of the Spirit is these. This is what the inner man does. Love, agape, walking after the commandments of God. Joy, kara. Paul said, we, have, we rejoice. We rejoice. We can't rejoice with iniquity. Kara. J-A-R-A. That's rejoice. It comes the word charis. Y'all know how much there is to this pinwheel? It's everything good and bad, and everything is by the sovereign will of God, the spiritual Sabbath. Your unbelief has to decrease, and you have to, and your belief, your faith, believe in faith are the same word. Believe is the verb, and faith is the noun. And faith has to increase, and he names seven things. I've, I've seen how this is all coming together. I have discovered some things in the last few months. The things that go together in spiritual circumcision, that's the cutting off of the filth of the flesh. And the Bible says that is the same way that the, they were saved, eight souls were saved through water, not by water. The water wasn't the baptism. The pitch of the ark was the baptism. Pitch with pitch has the same meaning as baptism with babto. 
pitch was red, came out of either ground or a tree, and they pitched the ark so that it wouldn't sink. I can't get... I've just been seeing all these things fit together. Increase death to self. Spiritual circumcision will increase death to self. Daily cross will increase death to self. Drinking a cup daily will increase death to self. Blood baptism will increase death to self. At face increases, self will decrease. Spiritual Sabbath is when you increase unbelief and you have to increase death to self because unbelief is, is living to self. Predestination, I don't know, I can't spell. We're predestined to conform to the likeness of the inner man. predestined to conform to Christ's likeness. Well, that's the inner man. Deny self means to utterly contradict self. That, that has to increase. Worshiping is it's coming before God and saying, whatever you want me to have. It's all the same. And a demon is self. And he, the demon have self has to decrease. And scourge has to increase in our life so we can have much tribulation. And the scapegoat that was driven into the wilderness is decreasing of self. We found that in the 11th chapter of Luke. All this is just death to your flesh. And you say, gosh, I don't want to give it up. Well, I know most of you are not going to want to because you're young. You gotta just come to the realization I've got to deal with my flesh every day. This is not something new. I know what it's like. You think I had never been there? I go through that. I got a thin veneer of that right now around my life. But you know, I believe if the preachers would tell the truth to people about what they wrestle with. We're not supposed to be discussing in detail about our thoughts. I know what men think because I are one. If I am one, I know what you think. When you see a woman scantily clad at the grocery store, I know how you think. But guess what? John MacArthur and Billy Graham knows how you knew how you thought to. They can't get away from that. They know what they have to stay away from. Don't tell me they don't like it when it brush comes across their face because they do. They lie. I'm not saying that gives you a license to go chase it. That's, I'm just telling you that's that outer man that's alive and well in every young man. And that's something you got to fight. And that inner man, when you read the Word, you study truth, you live according to what God wants you to, your life starts changing. And everything gets peaceful after a while. Do I have any time left, Mike? Six. Six minutes. I've got so many things. Just let me go over here to Second Peter. I went through kind of all of these things. They're all death to self. They're all in the sovereign will of God. These are for the believers, for His elect family. That's what it's for. He says over here in Second Peter 1 and 5, besides all this, give all diligence, add to your dying Add to your faith. And that's dying. Add to your daily cross. A daily cross is dying. Add to your drinking the cup. Add to your blood baptism. Add to your spiritual circumcision. Your daily cross, your increasing death to self. Get rid of that scapegoat that's on your back. 
and he's the outer man. I believe preachers told the people the truth about this, about their own lives and what they've wrestled with, that people would have more appreciation for the preacher because he was identifying with his congregation then. Paul said, oh, wretched man that I am. I've done so many things that's wrong. He said, I was a killer of Christians. Well, he said some things to us that we never have said to anybody. He killed Christians by the hundreds. He was a murderer of Christians. He said he was. He said, I slaughtered the church. He wasn't proud of that. He was ashamed. He said, you have to add knowledge. That takes years to do that. You have to add temperance. The inkratia means inner strength. That's the inner man. Knowledge has to do with the inner man. Virtue has to do with the inner man. Patience has to do with the inner man. Godliness has to do with the inner man. Add all these things. Brotherly kindness, philos, adelphos. But you can't be you can't be friends with your brother unless he wants to walk in truth because you're to separate from them if they want to live any other way. So if you separate, you're doing God's will with them. And charity. Charity is agape, that's walk in God's commandments. But if they won't walk in God's commandments, they're violating all these others. And if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. He that lacketh these things as a believer is blind and cannot see afar off. He's not saying he can't see, he can't see far. And hath forgotten this proves he's a believer. He's forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure by adding these things. Sure doesn't mean to be positive. It's the word be by us. Stabilize. You want to stabilize your life? It means to stabilize your life by adding all those things to this inner man. And it'll get to where, as you grow older, you can overthrow that outer man that wants to live according to the flesh. People say, well, God forgives you your sin all at once. Well, he does. But there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. If we sin after we come to the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth a scourge. I know everybody has these same problems. I've had them. Still have some lightweight ones to a degree. But I fight it every day. Well, that's what you need to do. Well, there's so many more things I can say on this. It's This is a reality check on our lives, what we have to do. We have to deal with that outer man. He wants to break God's law continually, doesn't he? Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for truth. I pray for all those that have been watching the believers that love this message, give them strength to battle the people that are opposing the Word of God and yet calling themselves Christians. Lord, stop them in their tracks. Cause them to see the truth. We'll praise you for everything, give you glory for everything that happens. Strengthen the sheep, Lord. There's people that are out there that say, I want to be strong in the faith. Well, it can't happen all at once. You've got to get rid of that outer man. That takes years, and that's something God does and we don't do. Thank you for everything. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, I hope that bothers, bothers people. It should.
I watch these things come together and, and don't do nothing but convict my heart. Thank you. 